Hello everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar, Get to Know the IACA. My name is Julia Kiefer. I'm the assistant of institutional visits of ELSA VU Vienna. Um, in cooperation with my colleagues of ELSA Vienna, we are presenting this webinar. Um, I also welcome and thank the Dean and Executive Secretary, Thomas Stelzer. Thank you and welcome to this um, yeah, webinar. First of all, I have to inform everyone that um, this webinar will be recorded. So um, you can watch it on the website if you want afterwards. Um, as well, I have the honor to mark this especially this special week because on the 8th of March, Yaka's 10th anniversary uh, was, yeah, was, uh, was. And um, on the 8th of March 2011, um, the Yaka was recognized as an um, um, official organization. So that's uh, enough for me. Now I want to continue with um, a short overview about the structure, what we will uh, talk about today. We will talk about the history of the IACA, the current projects, why anti-corruption is so important, um, as well as how the IACA courses can enhance and, enhance and benefit your career and who are the YACA's participants and alumni members, as well as in the, in the end, we will have a short Q&A um, session. So first of all, I want to welcome another time and um, yeah, say hello to Mr. Stelzer. I want to give a short introduction to him, uh, of him. Mr. Stelzer has been a member of the Foreign Service of the Republic of Austria, and he has served as a permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations office in Vienna. As well, he has been the president of the Klang Forum in Wien. Mm -hmm. This is an Austrian this is an ensemble for contemporary classical music. Welcome and thank you for taking the time for this hour. So in order to start, um, I want uh, to ask you to tell us a bit about the Yaka, what its mandate uh, about it and how the idea came up to create this organization. Thank you very much for this invitation and for this opportunity to introduce IACA, the International Anti-Corruption Academy, uh, to the world. Uh, I'm here in Luxembourg at our headquarters. That's a small village close to Vienna. And I'm greeting everybody, wherever you are following this webinar, uh, supposedly from many continents in many time zones, so I'm not saying good afternoon or good morning, I just say Chris Gott, as we say in Austria. Uh, welcome. The idea of this institution goes back to about 2007. You know, when I was, as you mentioned, it's a permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations uh, in Vienna, uh, starting in 2001. The very first crime commission conference that I chaired passed a resolution which stated that corruption is a, uh, an obstacle uh, to sustainable development, a structural impediment to, su to sustainable development, uh, to quote it correctly. And that struck me, you know. And uh, wh while I did not really recognize the full impact of this statement at that time, it followed me and it brought me back 20 years later uh, to fighting corruption. You know, we, from 2002 to 2003, we negotiated the United Nations Convention Against Corruption in Vienna. I was one of the negotiators and I led the negotiations of the last chapter, the implementation chapter. Now, this IACA, this UNCAC, as they call it, UN Convention Against Corruption, is a very important legal instrument, not only because it's global, it has 185 participants, which is, makes it a global convention, but also from its content. You know, while corruption has always been with us, it has always been perceived as a shadow, like all 
penetrating all societies, impeding us. But uh, it has been it has been somehow perceived as too big to be fought. There was no real uh, way to fight corruption. UNCAC, the convention, gave us clear legal provisions to start fighting corruption on the basis of the rule of law and efficiently. So this is a great achievement, a breakthrough. But you know that so many times when in the framework of the United Nations we negotiate a result, a convention, and put so much energy into, receive, into achieving a consensus on the content, very often afterwards we don't have the energy anymore to implement this legal instrument. And many of the UN uh, conventions have become dead wood. They have not been implemented. But of course the essence in a convention is in its implementation. Otherwise, you know, it is not real. So in about 2007, I became a little bit frustrated. I was still perm rep in Vienna with the slow pace of implementation of the convention. So together with the, uh, with the head of, with the chief of the anti, uh, anti-corruption branch of the UN office in Vienna, uh, we started developing an idea, how could we support implementation and facilitate implementation uh, of this, of this uh, quite complex uh, convention. You know, and then uh, in the end, IACA was established. Uh, a few years later, as this institution, different from how we had imagined it, because in the process I left, 2008, I was called to New York, and uh, I served then uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, as his Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination for the next five years. Uh, so I lost a little bit track of what was going on in Vienna. I was overwhelmed with the challenges of New York. But I did accompany Ban Ki-moon to the opening conference of IACA in Vienna on the 8th of March 2010. So as you said before, uh, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary a few days ago, 10 years of IACA. So the original idea was to facilitate implementation of UNCAC, and this is still the main content uh, of our mandate. Now, as I said, you know, it was, we, we were found a little bit different from how we had perceived in the beginning. Uh, we did not uh, we were not established within the United Nations, but as a separate international organization, uh, independent from the United Nations. <laughs> and uh, for the first 10 years, we were uh, a little bit inward looking with what we did. You know, we did achieve quite a lot. You know, today we are not only the only international organization globally dealing exclusively with the fight against corruption. You have it in the back of me, fighting corruption holistically. But we're also the only international organization which is at the same time an institution of higher learning. That means our technical assistance program is very much based on academic training. Uh, we are the only international organization that is authorized uh, to offer academic degrees. And therefore, the backbone of our activities have been our two master's programs, one more academic, one a little bit more for praxis oriented, uh, which we offer to practitioners globally, so we can help them build capacities and improve their own capacities uh, to fight corruption better. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing answer. And I want to um, continue on that because you mentioned uh, that the IACA is an international organization as well as a post-secondary um, educational institution. So um, yeah, that's why uh, the question comes up. The, the uh, structure will be, I, I guess, kind of unique and complex. And I would be pleased if you could explain us the main pillars of, um, yeah, of the academic governance in here. You know, as an international organization, we are intergovernmental. So the majority of our parties are states, UN member states, 76 of them. 
So we've been growing quite quickly and we are a large international organization, not fully globally yet, but with participants from all regions in the world, plus four international organizations. So right now we have 80 members, 80 participants in our organization, who meet every year at least once in the assembly of parties. That's the highest authority and uh, takes de decisions on strategic, on strategy, and of course also on our budget. Then we have a Board of Governors. The Board of Governors, in fact, has uh, accumulates a much of the decision-making power. The Assembly has outsourced quite a lot to the Board of Governors. So the 11 members of the Board of Governors, uh, are my, the, the, I am you know, in first line accountable to the Board and to the uh, Assembly of Parties. We have a Board of Governors meeting tomorrow that uh, we have one a few times a year so that uh, we produce the necessary transparency and accountability. Me as a dean, I'm more or less the CEO of the organization. I'm responsible for the daily business and for implementation of the strategy, of the strategy uh, which was approved by the board and then uh, adopted by the assembly. And then we have two uh, international advisory boards. We have a senior advisory board and we have an, an international academic advisory board, since we're an academic institution. That's our governance structure, uh, you know, uh, which guarantees that uh, we live up to the expectations and the highest expectation, of course, of transparency. You know, in fighting corruption, the most important principle is, of course, transparency. And uh, we take this very serious. So our governance structure is very clear, very transparent. Uh, you can find everything on our homepage, uh, IACA, I-A-C-A dot I-N-T. Uh, you have all the information there, our, all our founding documents, our rules of regulations, our budget, uh, our programs, our governing structure, everything you can find uh, on this homepage uh, in a very transparent way. So that's about our government structure. But of course, that enables our work. But uh, what is important is how we add value to the international system. Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would very much appreciate a conversation between the two of us. Former yes. diplomats have a tendency to don't, to don't give back the microphone once they received it. So please just stop me and ask okay. the questions uh, that you want yes. to direct to me. Uh, with a pleasure. Good dialogue here. With a pleasure, yes. I want to um, talk more about the parties. Uh, you mentioned you have like um, 80 members. And I would like to know um, yeah, some names about the parties and the participants. Who, what, how, whom can I imagine in there? Well, you know, this is a gradual growth process. You know, mm -hmm. we have now 80 members with a tendency to grow. We have several new members in the pipeline already. And we are now trying to, to uh, make our organization truly global. Mm -hmm. uh, but for that, you have to do some homework. And in fact, uh, since our meeting started here, our webinar, I just arrived, I just received some very, very pertinent information, uh, which uh, <laughs> I'd like to share with you right now. Uh, because the question is always, you know, the cui bono, who are we doing it for, where do we add value, and where do we see ourselves in the international system? And uh, let me just put this into a little bit into context. You know, when we started out with negotiation of UNCAC, of the convention, the fight against corruption was pretty much nowhere. You know, it was marginalized, there was very little going on, there was Transparency International, uh, there was some some public uh, information, some advocacy for fighting corruption, but it was not a cross-cutting issue on the global agenda. That has changed in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Because when, with the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals that you are familiar with, of the UN, mm -hmm. of the United Nations, and the Agenda 2030, corruption suddenly became a cross-cutting agenda. You know, there's this 15 goals which are content and which 
sort of accumulate in baskets the entire global agenda from access to education to clean water, gender issues, seas, forests, uh, economic development, uh, 15 points. And uh, SDG 16 is the SDG for the good governance. That's the one that tries to provide for the institution that enable implementation of all the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And uh, in SDG 16, as target five, we have to fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. So suddenly corruption finds itself at the heart of the matter as target five of SDG 16. So that puts the fight against corruption very quickly at the center of the global agenda. Mm -hmm. Because politically speaking, you know, if you look around today, you know, in the last years, many of the, of the global institutions that we had built in the last decades were severely weakened. So the UN is looking at what it has. And the greatest achievement of the United Nations in the last decades were the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the adoption of the SDGs. So SDG implementation is at the heart of UN activities. But the question is always how to do that. How do we raise the money to finance the transition from fossil to sustainable energy and the implementation of the SDGs? There's never enough money, of course. And there's enough money, as we have just seen in the COVID uh, situation. More money than we had ever imagined. But it's very difficult to raise money uh, long term and for the future. So, yeah, I think, yeah, and so the buy question, the money probably is also like how do you do it in a binding way because i mean like if you break the rule what what happens then i think it's also not this, this is the reason yeah that's exactly you ref, you put your finger exactly now on the on the wound yes. as we on say the wound, yes. yes you know uh if you look at the global scenario and uh, look at these enormous amounts of money which are siphoned away from productive economies by illicit flows and activities, like by corruption and bribery. Amounts that we cannot really quantify. We can only estimate them, but estimates go in between 1.5 to $2 trillion, which is per year. Per year. <laughs> this is money that cannot be compensated for, neither by ODA, by the Official Development Assistance, mm -hmm. nor by direct investments, nor by remittances, the money that guest workers send home to the families, which normally flows directly into development. Mm -hmm. So there is a growing understanding that if to raise the money for implementation of the SDGs, success in the fight against corruption becomes a precondition, a conditio sine qua non. And exactly. that puts corruption, the fight against corruption, at the center of UN and global activities as a cross-cutting agenda, because it fits into each one, each one of the SDGs. You need the means, the financial means, to implement each one of the SDGs. So the fight against corruption and success is linked to each one of the SDGs. Mm. Mm. Yeah, as so a basement. This, this moved corruption in these last two decades from the margins to the center of the international uh, business, of the agenda. And this is where we find ourselves today. And uh, this is the huge challenge. Yes. You know that right now we're in, a, in the middle of very interesting processes. The United Nations General Assembly has decided to hold uh, in June, most likely, depending on the COVID situation, but now anticipated for June, a special session of the UN General Assembly against corruption. So that shows how important corruption as a topic has become. Mm -hmm. So we are now in the process of preparing for this uh, General Assembly. And when will it be? In June, we anticipate June. it. Okay, yes. Are you in June. Yes. In June. I will not tell you where it's going to be because that depends on whether it's going to be virtual or hybrid or in person. You know, this is very difficult uh, with this with this uh, virus, which is so difficult to manage and yes, which yes, is yes. Us, 
uh, we'll have to adapt to it. But the time frame now is June. Mm -hmm. And the outcome paper, the results of this process, of course, will facilitate. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will maybe uh, define the parameters within which a future anti-corruption global architecture can organically develop. That's important. And there's always the question, always the question in this process and also in supporting mechanisms as the recent uh, high-level panel on integrity, transparency and accountability FACTI, same purpose, mm -hmm. which was looking into how we can increase tax revenues for countries by mm -hmm. limiting like illicit flows. The IACA, sorry for, uh, for interrupting, but that I understand everything. Uh, so uh, you're talking about the, what the doings about the IACA, what um, the, I have talked a little bit more about the, the general, the, the larger context in which we see ourselves. Yes, yes. Because my yes. question with IACA is always, how can we add value to the global system? You know, our value is not to train a certain number of people, mm -hmm. but our value is to facilitate implementation of the convention of UNCAC. You know, each one of the provisions of UNCAC of the legal provision needs to be implemented. Mm. And when you have a, a convention like this, you ask yourself, how do we implement it? Yes, the, the exact um, measures would be very interesting. Like, well, the, the, I, I can go with you through the through the convention, but that's a little bit complex now. You know, we can also find it, but I can go through several provisions which are spe specially important and interesting. Let's for, let me first say one thing. I talked about the importance of implementation and uh, what is the danger of petrifying and making mm -hmm. that the first, uh, first question is always what we call in the global context, the UN context, advocacy. How mm -hmm. do we help our constituents understand what is in the shared interest? And in the context of UNCAC, it is how can we help understand our constituents decision makers, politicians, civil society, academia, uh, everybody who has something at stake in mm -hmm. this country. That implementation is in the shared interest. That's the first step. Once we have mm -hmm. done this, we can think, how do we now go ahead and about to implement the legal provisions? And uh, for that, normally, or in this context, we need to offer some technical assistance, translate the legal provisions, to practitioners in all the 185 member mm -hmm. countries of the convention and to help them implement the provisions. For example, you know, the, the, the convention does not have a global definition for corruption. Uh, that was impossible. It is not necessary because corruption needs to be criminalized, chapter three of the convention, in each mm -hmm. legislation, each country. So each country has to criminalize corruption and define corruption within its criminal law system. I see, now, very individual. Yeah, yeah, but of course, you know, there, there, there are strong common denominators which give guidelines, but it's up to the countries how far they go. You I know, uh, for example, the country that I am in right now, Austria, goes very far. It includes in the corruption paragraphs of the legal system also uh, football referees, Austrians, who are uh, guiding a football match outside of Austria. So that's a very far, far uh, uh, notion to subsume uh, also the, the referees. Others have different, but this is individual, each country. Mm -hmm. But there are very strong common denominators, very strong guidelines, how you fight corruption and how the systems have to be. Now, what's important is the convention implementation of the legal provisions help strengthen in the respective countries the anti-corruption systems, mm -hmm. which are on the one hand side criminal law systems, but on the other hand other systems, prevention, education systems, mm -hmm. uh, society, social protection, you know, which all right. feed into mm -hmm. stronger, more resilient societies. And the goal is to provide circumstances, knowledge, technical capacity to fight corruption mm -hmm. through the implementation of UNCAC, of the Convention, 
on the basis of the rule of law, excluding impunity, mm -hmm. efficiency. That's uh, what, what we are striving for. Okay, and, and yeah, for every country is deciding in his its way how to how to do it in a in a yeah in a, in a small yes exactly and so what we do is you know our small organization here in Luxembourg we have mm -hmm. been concentrating for the first ten years very much on the educational aspect yes okay uh, that's why you are also an educational uh, institution exactly within the Bologna system. Mm -hmm. So our degrees, our degrees are recognized uh, by the 48 members, member countries of the Bologna system. So that's an international recognized uh, master's program. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, have been, we have been offering this program to mainly practitioners okay. all over the world. Like, Maybe. for example, like um, also like a ministry or who is uh, like yes. a practitioner in Prosecu this? Prosecutors civil servants, mm -hmm. judicial personnel, mm -hmm. police, everybody who has anything to do with fighting corruption okay. uh, is, you know, might find it very rewarding to strengthen his or her own capacity through our program. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is mainly our group of people, mid-life career uh, practitioners who come, who recognize we need some special training, we are lawyers, but now we need some special anti-corruption training, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, so, so, so we have been offering these two programs. We are also offering com complementary programs, like our summer academy, oh, yeah. I, I had which is complementary, which takes place in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. We have done it in Asia, in Africa, in South America, uh, and which complements academic programs. And through these... So is it like a course? Yes. Like, yes. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's different structured from the academic approach of the master's program. It's more for practitioners. Brings people together. Uh, it's like a, uh, an open market, an exchange of information, networking also, of course, linking people, uh, helping to understand issues better, but also uh, factual, uh, also academic, and we have with this process, which is very inclusive. <coughs> sorry, we have been able to train until now more than three thousand people from all over the world. <coughs> in one hundred sixty-two countries. Mm -hmm. So this is something, you know, uh, which, which uh, has been recognized and we have been lauded for that. Because each one of these more than 3,000 alumni who through our programs, uh, academic programs, outreach, have been able to understand better how to fight corruption more efficiently on mm -hmm. the basis of the rule of law. They all know IACA. We try to keep our relations with them. We try to also cultivate them, our relations, and they're also bridgeheads in their countries because they're influencers. They have their own networks. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, uh, many of them are like uh, diplomats, like ambassadors of IACA, and especially of content providers for all the others. So this 3000 alumni uh, is a global network of specially prepared practitioners in the fight against corruption. And this is what we have been doing mainly. We have and been doing more, yeah. Uh, regarding the rule of law, so uh, is it like international law what you're teaching or is it, uh, uh, how can I? Our program offer is multifaceted. You know, we teach so many different things in the program. Okay. Uh, we have eight modules, you know, you, you can look at them also on our homepage. You know, there are, you know, since fighting corruption includes so many different aspects, also our uh, programs are multifaceted. So of course, we also mm -hmm. teach international law, but we in, uh, teach also the understanding for law. How do you strengthen, how do you articulate laws, how do you prepare laws? but mm, also how okay, do we implement laws and also institutions or mm. in connection with UNCAC. You know, the, the convention tells us 
uh, how to build the future. It, it suggests how to build institutions yeah. that are transparent, independent, out of influence from politicians, well financed, that they can be efficient. You know, so we explain what that means and, uh, and uh, try to, he uh, to help, of course, uh, build a network of, uh, of specialists, practitioners, but also specialized uh, to work in their home uh, countries. And then, of course, we follow up. You know, this is only one of the aspects that we try to provide. We have also a pillar which we call uh, capacity building and tailor-made programs. Uh, where we work uh, with member states, with institutions, because each one of our 80 parties has a different system. You know, none of them is the same. And yeah. has a different development of the system. Uh, in some countries are further the development of the rule of law and the good governance than others. There is no perfect society, as we know. Corruption is ubiquitous. There's not one country in the world which can say there's no corruption whatsoever. Uh, but there are countries which have stronger systems than others. So this is why our approach is demand-oriented. Mm -hmm. We work with our parties, we analyze with them how we can provide knowledge and technical assistance tailor-made for them to make our programs more focused, more mm -hmm. efficient, and uh, you know more more uh, relevant for our parties. So we work with them in different ways. We help to them train uh, civil servants in the understanding of the fighting against corruption. Recently, we have built one of our members an anti-corruption department in their civil administration. We yeah. work with regional organizations so we can reach out to countries which have similar interests also language-wise. Mm -hmm. We also work with the private sector very strongly, and this is a very important issue. So we're How not only that, with yes. governments, but with the private sector. Yes, like? Because well, private you know, sector and corruption is not so known, I have to say. <laughs> well, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, this, in the real world, you know, it's the real world is very far from perfect. And you know, you, you have to see the world, uh, I think, in an in a interconnected way. And mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the anti-bribery convention of the OECD, you know, which has fewer members than UNCAC, but which is far advanced in implementation, that sets the parameters for compliance for globally acting companies. Okay. Because companies have to abide by the standards to do business in certain countries. And uh, in a country where the anti-bribery convention has been implemented, glo global enterprises have to comply with that. That means they have to build up their own compliance and ethic capacities. You know, we have many exceptions, many examples here, you know, uh, from the past and also from the present. And uh, so this is a, 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 an increasingly important trend most of the big companies already have their compliance departments. So they do compliance training for their staff. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can't do business. And uh, here are very different technical providers, you know, the private providers. But we're the only international organization as a technical assistance provider. So we can do things that others cannot. Like what? Well, we have access to certain experts, okay. which others don't have. Mm -hmm. Plus, of course, as an international organization, we're impartial. So that gives us a certain quality status, which is important for many companies. Mm -hmm. So we have been working with companies in the past, but this is also a very strong future project. And if I just, just have to take one minute here, you know, there is something which is very important in the United Nations. It's called the UN Global Compact. Yes. Which brings together tens of thousands of global companies and they all signed 10 principles. I don't want to say 10 commandments, but 10 principles. And the last one is, is, is anti-corruption and anti-bribery compliance. Mm -hmm. So there is already a network to build upon. And the idea is that 
you know, the first is advocacy. We have to bring the idea of of compliance very not even stronger into the global scenario. Working with networks that already exist. We are working intensely already with the Davos Forum, for example. Mm -hmm. That brings together every year the creme de la creme of the international uh, and economy and, and uh, companies, and not only the CEOs who might be interested in short-term gains and, and shareholder satisfaction, but the owners who have mm -hmm. normally much more long-term gains. So this is very interesting for us to work with these companies to first, you know, it's always a three-stage approach. The first st stage is help understand where corruption happens, to see corruption understand where okay to see corruption's first step exactly second step is is this consciousness making step mm -hmm. after step. seeing to become yeah. conscious yeah. about what you see why mm -hmm. corruption should be fought why it's in our shared interest to fight corruption mm -hmm. and the third step is tactic assistance to help them how to do it how to fight to corruption. improve mm -hmm. so this is the three-stage system uh, which can apply to everything and my hope is that if you look at the global economies today, the global situation, the huge funds are increasingly directing the large uh, investments into sectors of the global economy, which have already initiated the transformation from fossil to sustainable energy. There's a clear trend. And my dream is, of course, and my vision, that uh, without soon, that also compliance issues will influence global investment trends. And that uh, companies that comply with the rules and that have developed certain ethical standards will receive more uh, investments than others. So this will be a global trend which we need to influence and direct and develop. So I see a lot of, of uh, work here challenges mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, growing demand structure globally. Yeah, and um, regarding the current situation, you mentioned as well. Um, I'm very interested how uh, for the IACA, like on the one hand, international organization, but on the other hand, educational institution. How are like uh, yeah the difficulties regarding the COVID crisis? How do you uh, how did you solve? Or how is it going on in this case? It's a huge challenge, you know, like for <laughs> I mean, the I COVID crisis, the biggest challenge we had never imagined uh, mm -hmm. before. And we hadn't prepared for it. You know, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, two weeks after my arrival at the ARC, we were closed down for the COVID crisis. I arrived two weeks before the first lockdown. In the Last area. year? Okay. Last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so suddenly we found ourselves incapacitated. You know, mm -hmm. we could not deliver our programs anymore. All our programs used to be rather conservative, face-to-face. -face. Our students would come to Luxembourg. In, in Luxembourg. Would come, mm -hmm. They would travel. And we couldn't do this anymore. Because yes. there was no traveling anymore. Nobody could travel. So we shut down, more or less, for a few mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. But that was dramatic for us. Because our programs are self-financing. You know, we are not for profit. We don't make money. But the... We, with, with tuition and with other contributions, we finance the programs. Mm -hmm. By the way, many of our participants who cannot afford the programs mm -hmm. are offered financial assistance. Oh. You know, we have important partners like Siemens. You know, Siemens is one of these glorious examples mm -hmm. that in the past, uh, you know, had, were, were told to pay a huge amount of money for previous sins you know, against the primary convention. And ah, because this, they breached it or what? Sorry? Because they breached it or why? Did, no, why no, did no. It? I mean, it was just a little bit translation. No, we, you know, in, in the United States, uh, companies uh, were taken to do account and uh, to continue working, you know, they had to agree to pay enormous uh, amounts of, of compensation. It happens all the time. And Siemens made the best out of that hundred million dollars they had to invest into good causes and they have become our most important partner. Amazing. So with Siemens, we are able to finance a fund which makes available financial aid 
to participants in our programs from least developed countries or also individuals who cannot afford it. So there is no money limit to join our programs. Thanks to our uh, partner Siemens, uh, that has been helping us uh, in this implementation process. So that's a very good example of, you know, how uh, of, of partnerships, you know, of sometimes unaccepted partnership and how you can make good uh, uh, for the future. A win-win situation, yes. A win-win, for us a win-win situation, because this also helps us, of course, to, uh, to, uh, to help and finance and strengthen our alumni system. You know, this is mainly what we use. We use yes. this money for alumni. Thank you. Thank you that you are mentioning also the alumni, because I want to also ask some questions about that. So how do you um, bring them together or stay them together? How is here uh, work done? Well, Julia, this is a huge, you know, this is in the context now of COVID. Let me just say one, two sentences first to this shutdown. Because uh, with the shutdown, uh, we couldn't deliver our programs anymore. Mm. So we lost our income also. So mm. we were really, uh, we were really in a bad situation. But uh, we had, we turned, we took this challenge and turned it into an opportunity. We took all our content of 10 years, all our expertise, our content, and within a few weeks, we translated it into an online, an, an, an IT online level. Mm -hmm. And six weeks after the shutdown, we continued offering our master's programs online. Mm -hmm. Our students no longer coming in person to Luxembourg, but participating from five continents in our programs. Our professors not flying to Vienna and Luxembourg, taking out a whole week of their busy schedule to teach for two days, but being connected from the offices. So we recognize that this is a great opportunity. Yes, you know, yes. only, of course, it's sad for the students not to come to Vienna. Right. But on the other hand, it's much more economic, you know, much more cost effective, leaves a much smaller environmental imprint, mm -hmm. uh, fewer, fewer emissions because you don't have to travel. And the effect is, is very strong. So our, our programs became even more efficient. And it opened a new window for us. You know, when I came to Yaka, the first time I met my team, uh, we discussed, you know, where, in which direction you want to go. And uh, we discussed this uh, 3,000 alumni, and I said, this is an amazing achievement. You know, it's great to do that. But we have to scale up our diffusion capacity. Mm -hmm. We cannot be satisfied with 3,000. There are tens of thousands of practitioners out there who need our support. Yeah. So we had to have to reinvent ourselves and to think, how can we offer our products to many more, to tens of thousands? And the lockdown helped here, you know. So we were forced to try out e-learning, which works. We have been having one year of, of, of uh, dry run now. You know, it works yes. very well. And now our challenge is how to scale up. Mm -hmm. And my vision is that in the future, we will provide every future diplomat, every future manager of the international system, but also every future manager of globally acting enterprises of the private sector with anti-corruption training. First, help them understand what corruption is. Mm -hmm. Second, help them understand why corruption has to be fought, because it's a cancer, weakens society, distorts the economy, only bad. And the third is how to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge, to go on scale. Now, not anymore isolated here in Luxembourg, but going online, mm -hmm. making us ourselves available to the UN system. Because there's nobody in the UN system like us. We're the only ones. There are also others who work in the field against corruption, like the UNODC in Vienna, uh, the guardians of the UNCAC, but mm -hmm. they work more on the normative level. On the individual normative level, you mean on the country based? They try based? to help uh, develop the rules. Uh, they were managing the, the negotiation process of the convention. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, UNDP in New York does on the ground uh, work, but they also do many other things. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But we're the only ones who only concentrate on corruption. Yeah. You know, so I think we can bring a lot. It, plus UNESCO does a lot of anti-corruption training. Many institutions do a lot of anti-corruption training, That's but right. it is mm -hmm. not brought together. It is not coordinated. The dots are not co coordinated and brought together. Therefore, we always we continue reinventing the wheel without producing the synergies and the impact we should. And this is our role. Mm -hmm. Making ourselves available as the small partner, implementation partner, to the normative uh, captains of UNODC and help them implement the program. You know, do field work, work on the ground by offering uh, academic programs, offering uh, technical assistance in many different fields, and also becoming a research center. And this is very important. IACA? Yeah, you know, uh, IACA, the third pillar of our work is research. I see. But Right now, we had for, for budget, we had we, we were budget, you know, we had a very bad financial crisis uh, until recently, which we just come out of, you know, we just left the intensive care, uh, and we are now on the on the trajectory of financial healing, and looking forward. So this is, I think, something we 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 managed also with the help of our host country, who supported us tremendously here. And uh, now we can go out as, as uh, more self-assured, we're not insolvent anymore, and we can really take up the challenges and rebuild our, our research department. So I'm a strong believer in evidence-based decision-making. Decision-makers need evidence. And we see the COVID crisis. The governments that relied on, on scientists did much better than the governments who didn't. And it's the same in fighting corruption. You know, if rely on evidence, you do better. But where do you draw evidence from? From research. Mm, for sure. But there's a lot of research being done in the field of corruption globally, but it's not connected. It's very stratified. Mm -hmm. And existing programs, there are existing programs, they have not managed to bring it together. So on the 1st of April, uh, we are bringing on board a senior researcher. There's the first position I hired uh, once I had the money. Uh, with the first goal to build a global repository for research. Amazing. You know what that is? That means we just bring together what is out there electronically. So we'll that connect the data mission mm -hmm. in anti corruption mm -hmm. can click himself or herself through our homepage to the result, a repository. Then in the second stage, we're going to build an own research capacity to identify lacunae and to help direct research. And in the third stage, uh, which we're also starting already, uh, we build a PhD program mm -hmm. that will bring together our master's programs, our research department, and the global network of research institutions, universities, uh, in a strong integrative platform. Mm -hmm. So these are the three levers we are building right now as a research uh, capacity. Wow, yeah. nice research connection, yes. Yeah, data are the basement mostly. I think it's very important. You know, we need the research. And, uh, and there, there are many, many, so many open questions. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, whistleblowers. Yeah. You know, whistleblowers yeah. are, are, mm -hmm. are very important uh, for fighting corruption because, I mean, there is a human right for information. But how yes, do it you is. Article. <laughs> how do you provide transparency? Mm. Somebody has to do that. So the whistleblowers, and they are not protected in many countries, and there's not much research done on them. And even UNCAC is very weak on the whistleblowers, you know, mm -hmm. just considering supporting, strengthening whistleblowers, protecting them. So we have to do a lot of research. That's one of the assets, of the aspects. Another aspect is uh, chapter five of the UNCAC. This is repatriation of illicitly gained fortunes which were transferred abroad. Mm -hmm. Kleptocrats that we always talk about who stole and, exp and, and uh, invested uh, the proceeds in bank accounts in different countries. We have always been able to locate this money, but there was no legal provision to bring it back into the economies that it was extracted from. Yeah. So now the UNCAC for the first time provides how to do that. 
-hmm. how this money can be brought back. But you know, there's not there's 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 so many open questions still. Yeah, you know? and there's no legal provision in this. The provision is there, but oh, it is okay. The provision is there, but it has to be uh, in general terms. But now we have to find out what does it mean, international corporations, mm -hmm. which steps are necessary to set processes into motion. See. What to do with the funds, you know, mm -hmm. that were located until the proceedings are finalized. You know, there is an interesting uh, idea in the in the fact dependent report, an escrow fund. So the money will be taken out of the bank accounts where it is and placed into an escrow account, uh, fund See. until the, mm -hmm. the proceedings will be finished. Like a neutral deposit. Um, exactly. I see. Which might speed up the process. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, there, are, there are so many open questions. You know, we, we don't even know how to measure corruption. Uh, yeah, I can we imagine. I, I would not have any. <laughs> we don't know yet. So a lot of research has to be done on how to measure corruption, which is maybe too big for us anyway. You know, we're a small institution. This is a huge project. Uh, measuring corruption, but here again, we can be the coordinator. You know, we're very small. You know, we will never be a big organization, and I don't want to. You know, we want to be a laboratory, an incubator. You know, bringing many aspects together, scaling them up, filling mm -hmm. them with life, coordinating and adding value to the yeah. global system uh, through our work. Make it visible, yes, for everyone. So, yes. But I've been talking so much, and I'm looking at the watch out at the clock. I yes. don't want to deprive uh, participants from questions. So I think Absolutely. maybe we should ask uh, for think, questions. Yeah. Yes, I think we will um, continue with the Q and A um, for the participants who can ask you. So I would like to give the floor um, my colleague. Um, Lara Rodriguez Radishat, who is um, yeah coordinating the participants' question. Um, dear Lara. Hello, thank you very much for the interesting interview and webinar. So I would like to give the floor to James, who has a question for us. So anybody has a question? Mr. Stelzer, you are muted. Okay. James, do you want to um, talk because you're muted? Ah, yeah, now it's okay. Okay. So I'm ready Thank for you. Well, first I wanted, I wanted to uh, thank you for for this informative session, uh, Dean, and uh, what I wanted to ask, if you don't mind, is one of the issues that you mentioned as being the most difficult for anti-corruption movements is implementation. And the, my organization, which is the International Economic Justice League, is an international nonprofit organization with the mission to abate corruption and promote ethical business practices. We target 18 to 30 year olds and, and we use a gamified rewards-based system to create this culture. It is a self-sustaining organization, meaning that once the initial investment is made, it generates its own income. And the rewards are to um, enterprises. Right? It, they provide both economic and social benefits to businesses, also to the participants, as well as to employers. The issue is we do we use online education and combined with cohort groups or local chapters to create this culture. <clears throat> Very much aligned with what you're doing in your concepts in terms of you know, education, but we target hundreds of millions of participants, which <laughs> could be feeders to your organization in terms of the need for education. My, my main question is, does IACA 
provide education or training to organizations such as mine to help with that implementation. Yes, uh, I can only say yes, yes, yes. You know, to be very true, my biggest challenge or our biggest challenge right now is how do we how do we dramatically increase our diffusion capacity? How do we go from uh, from 3,000 alumni to 50,000, 100,000? You know, in in practical terms, how do we to 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 borrow an expression from the from the private sector? How do we do targeted advertisement? When I sit on my computer screen. And I try to think and work on something. Very often, suddenly on my screen, an object appears that I might have looked for on Amazon or somewhere a few days ago, or which I might have mentioned as desirable to a friend. So somehow people know exactly what I think and what they think I need. And it appears on my screen. And that fascinates me. You know, sometimes I even buy it immediately because it's so easy to do it. My question is, how do we get to the point that when a practitioner, uh, when a an academic or a prosecutor or somebody sits in any country in the world, in Uganda or in Vietnam or in Brazil, and thinks about the problem, suddenly uh, Yaka appears on the screen and says, maybe we can help you. That's our homepage. Try our homepage and see whether we have a product that will help, help you. And we might have a product because we are diversifying our products tremendously now. And we can also offer academic training and our tailor-made programs. So how can we offer to anybody who might have a use for our knowledge what we can offer to them? So this is my biggest, uh, my biggest uh, challenge right now, uh, to find somebody who can help me. And what you just offered, you know, this kind of cooperation is absolutely worth being explored. So please contact us. And we can see uh, whether we can cooperate here. The, the fight against corruption has to be fought by everybody together. Well, I think you've, you, you're spot on in terms of what I think the synergies are. My background is in the private sector. And, and I've created many, many businesses in, in, in the billions of dollars. Of course, none of that attributes to me. <laughs> it's all for my clients. Yeah. But the issue here is, in our surveys, and we, we again, we target 18 to 30 year olds. Of course, we accept everybody into our program, but that's our primary target. Yeah. In our surveys, less than 5% of our demographic is even interested in corruption or anti-corruption measures, and they certainly lack the passion for it. So we had to create a way to stimulate the demand for the education and the awareness. And so that's what our program does. So we're creating the demands. So that's, the, so the, that's the first yeah. step. Just please, uh, you know, you find my access on the home page. Let's start, you know, even today, a communication on what we can do. You know, we, to work it out in detail, it's too far because we only have a few minutes left. But I'm very yes. much looking forward. Please contact me and let's continue that. Let's see how we can work together here. You know, this sounds very promising. Thank you. And just so you know, it's already been socialized. Uh, Ina Kube, who's one of your instructors, she's on our board of advisors. And I've already spoke to your director, your director of education. So I will definitely contact you today. Please do that. I'm looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, James. Now we would like to address so thank you very much, James. Now we would like to address the question of Mr. Felix. Um, yeah, so hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so yes. Um, thank, you, thank you for the um, um, for the webinar today. And my question was, um, you mentioned that, that Austria has very far reaching anti-corruption laws. Nonetheless, in the last few weeks, there were many allegations of corruption that even <clears throat> went into high ranks or um, many positions. Has uh, Austria a problem with applying these anti-corruption laws? 
us in looking backwards, it certainly also takes a long time until there is a conviction in um, certain corruption cases. Well, these are very critical questions. You know, normally we do not we do not comment on member states, you know, uh, as an international organization. But I can say something uh, to respond to your question. There's always a gap between the law and implementation. You know, uh, the world is imperfect, and we have to know where we want to move to. It might take times. You know, Austria, for example, they did establish exactly what Greco wanted. The institutions are all there. And, uh, you know, uh, implementation, of course, is another thing, but the discussion that's going on right now, I consider very healthy. That shows that we are making progress, that people don't, they, they, they take corruption serious, and there is hope that we can fight it. So I see this is a very positive process, which is going on in many countries. And, you know, if you look around today, uh, in many countries, in many jurisdictions, uh, the work of, of uh, anti-corruption prosecutors, officers have become very targeted. You know, presidents uh, were taken to court and held accountable. Uh, politicians, things happened, have been happening that we would not have considered possible uh, a few years ago. So I do see a progress here and process uh, as I said, no country is perfect. Uh, some countries are uh, less unequal and have better governance than others. But uh, this is what we're here for, to help all our countries uh, with the process of implementing UNCAC and therefore strengthening their own anti-corruption uh, systems. Important is that the institutions are established and then, with the experience, we learn how to make this institution uh, bad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, oh, the acoustics. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, please raise your questions and send them to our email address studies at ayaka.int. Thank you very much. Good. So far, we are in the end of the webinar. As Lara mentioned, if you have any question or want to connect with the Yaka, please uh, write in an un informal email. And yes, I want to thank you another time, Mr. Stelzer, for the nice uh, yeah, interview with you. It was very interesting. And yeah, do you want to say a last uh, word, participants as well? Well, thank you, Julia. You know, I, as you understood, uh, I love to talk about fighting corruption. Yes. I think it's not the only content uh, of my life right now, but I spent my energies on. But I think it's really relevant. It is important. I think the fight against corruption is so relevant for the implementation of the SDGs that we cannot hesitate, we can't wait, we have to come all together. And uh, this is also an open invitation, of course, to everybody to work with us. You know, we work with the system, we make ourselves available, uh, we want to add value, uh, we want to rely on others' experiences and infrastructure because the fight against corruption will only be won if you bring all levels together. Governments, civil society, academics, uh, private enterprises, uh, all the stakeholders uh, of goodwill and of understanding uh, have to come uh, together to fight the scourge of corruption, to strengthen our societies, to make them more just, more equitable, more productive, and to implement Agenda uh, 2030. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm always available for contact, for cooperation and for future events. Thank you. Thank you too. Yes, then uh, wish you a wonderful evening everyone and yeah, let's, uh, for, yeah, let's go forward to this vision of the Yaka. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much.